Stop the world! On this question of tariffs, I think the electric vehicle ones are the beginning of a series of tariffs that we are going to see emerging, restricting China's access to the European market. And this is meant to actually ensure level playing field and competitiveness for our companies. Welcome to Stop the World, the Aspie podcast on security and international affairs. I'm Olivia Nelson. And I'm David Rowe. Today on the podcast, we have the next episode of the Sydney Dialogue Summit Sessions. Yes, the Sydney Dialogue, or TSD as we call it, is less than three weeks away, and so we're cranking out the conversations. Today, we cover economic security with a discussion between our Executive Director, Justin Bassey, and Abigail Vassilier, who's head of the Foreign Relations Team at the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Berlin. Justin and Abigail discuss economic security in the context of Russia's war on Ukraine, China's use of economic coercion and support for Moscow, and how European and Indo-Pacific countries can respond both individually and collectively. One key feature of the discussion was the importance of critical technologies and supply chain security, and how Beijing has taken advantage of inconsistencies and different national approaches to security and de-risking, including on policies such as 5G in Germany. It's a matter of changing the mindset at the national level, and it's a matter of bringing the public opinion and to bring your companies on board with the way you want to de risk. A great conversation and at times a lively debate. I think that's enough from us, Dave. Over to Justin and Abigail. Abigail Vassilier, Director of Policy and European Affairs and Head of the Foreign Relations Program at Merix. Welcome to the ASPI podcast, Stop the World. Thanks, Justin. I'm very happy to be here with you. Great stuff, Abby. It really is a pleasure to have you join me on the podcast today to discuss all things strategic competition, economic security, and of course, Europe. Something, all things that will be discussed at ASPE's major cyber and critical tech summit later this year, the Sydney Dialogue. Abby, we recently met at a series of conferences in Europe, actually, but specifically at a conference on economic coercion in Vilnius, Lithuania, where participants from 30 countries discussed economic security and how to deal with the threat of economic coercion. And we enjoyed plenty of debate there. So I hope we can continue that debate on the podcast today. And we're recording the podcast as the 75th NATO summit takes place in Washington, D.C., with war continuing to rage in Ukraine, uncertainty over future U.S. policy towards NATO, and Russia and China working more closely together, with NATO's Secretary General Stoltenberg referring to China as the main enabler of Russia's war against Ukraine. So how significant a time in history do you think this is for Europe? Look, Justin, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here after our meetings in Europe to discuss economic security. And your question about a time in history, I think this is a time in history for European security in general. Russia's war in Ukraine has definitely put the spotlight on European political will to defend itself, to ensure peace and stability on the continent. And on that, it has also exposed all the weaknesses of how much and how far you still need to go to actually become the security player that matters. And this is why this time is critical for Europe and it's critical for the Europeans to take their responsibility vis-a-vis ensuring their security. And I think The question of responsibility is key today in Europe. The US has made clear that they have other priorities and that Europe needs to defend itself and to boost its defense budget, not because the US has asked for it, but just because it's in European interest. We may have a victory of Trump, which will leave with Europeans with no choice but to reinvest the security and defense field for their own sake, because Trump is not going to spend its time, its resources on Europe, but rather we focus on the Indo-Pacific. And I think We are in a moment where the trajectory is clear, there will be further fragmentation, there will be further instability, and either Europe does it now and deliver now on Ukraine, or it's going to be a long-term issue. And you mentioned China. 
as a support of Russia's war effort and for Europe today to juggle and connect China with European security and with the capacity of Europe to defend itself. That's where we are. And this is critical for us as Europeans to understand that correctly. I am keen to go through a number of those themes that you raised, Abby, from Europe's political will to be the security player that matters, as you described, as well as this Russia-China connection. I'm wondering that there's no doubt that the response to Russia's war in Ukraine has resulted in unity across NATO and the EU, and the top priority is the ongoing countering of the war. But do, do you think that we are doing enough in areas below the threshold of war, including in economic security and critical technologies. And I ask that in the context of as Europe looks to diversify away from uh, Russia in terms of economic and technological interests, is there a risk that some European countries see China as a necessary partner on economic and technological development? I think there are a few issues to disentangle here. The first is Europe as a strategic player. And you praised EU unity. I'm always going to praise the need for unity and the efforts we're making. But when it comes to having this strategic culture and to think strategically, we are not there yet because we think at 27. And you cannot compare a country like France that have had this notion of great power, including great power politics, with a country like Slovenia. And so to bring and to build a common strategic culture, this is what is happening this is where the difficulties are coming, but it's in the process and it's there and it's going to continue to grow. That's one first element when it comes to thinking about strategic competition and thinking about whether Europe is in that front. The articulation of economic issues, technology and security This is a complex set of issues for any countries, but when you think about it at 27 on a scale of a continent with different strategic culture, it becomes such a complex debate. And to disentangle it, I think we need to first recognize that Europe has started to think about economic issues and the security challenge that China presents back in 2016, back when we experienced a wave of strategic investment of Chinese state-owned enterprises and Chinese actors across the continent in our critical infrastructure. And this is the key moment, the first instance when Europe starts to articulate articulate economic interests with security issues related to China on the continent. And then there is a second moment where we start further articulated this. And when the Biden administration arrives, suddenly we have a partner in the US to basically also push us and also drive us through the G7, through NATO, with partners and allies in the region, including with Australia. And that makes the partnering element for Europe and bring further that debate on the articulation on economic issues and technology even much further. For the Europeans, one thing where we need to be clear about is the fact that we have three levels of responses and they are complementary, but at the same time, they oppose one another. The first level is at the national level. And member states, as I said, have different ways to think about it, but the security question remains a national competence. And member states like France are very adamant to say, we are not going to discuss economic security in the framework of NATO. Yes, we can discuss resilience, but economic issues, it's in the EU and security issues are dealt with at the national level. So you have understood with that that You have the national level, you have the European level, and you have NATO and the articulation of the nexus between economic issues and interests, security aspects and technological development are the intricacies of the three. And one last point that I'm going to make here is on the technology aspects. For Europe, I think it has been a very slow process 
to realize that the critical dependencies we have built need to be addressed. And in that, on the technological front, we have had different milestones. And I would say the last one is related to Taiwan and the realization that Europe is extremely dependent on Taiwan when it comes to the semiconductor industry and that this is a space where we need to address. So Europe has gone through, I would say, a revolution and started to think about economic security at 27. It has been very much pushed by this commission and will continue to be pushed by next one. But we are not yet in a space where we can say we are having a smooth and a clear trajectory when it comes to economic security. Really great summary, Abby, uh, in terms of the three levels, the national, EU, NATO, and what it means in relation to uh, security and the relationship with China. Let's break that down with the three levels that you took us through. If there's division or disagreement in relation to national policies, particularly relating to China, that necessarily would have an impact on the EU as a whole and NATO as a whole. So so how is Europe and particularly the major powers, how are they dealing with the fact that there is this disagreement? Because simply limiting security questions to the national level and saying we'll deal with economics through the EU in itself is a separation of economics and security. So how are we grappling with that as there is a recognition now, as you say, in recent years, that economics and security are one? Well, I think that has been one of the main issues for this commission. When they proposed the economic security strategy a year ago, and they faced, on one hand, a recognition by member states that economic security was important, but on the other hand, a very strong pushback from member states which did not endorse that strategy, meaning that they did not agree to go on responding to economic security at 27. And when we saw over the past year the efforts to say, okay, well, if there is this recognition that we will have to tackle economic security at 27, let's first start by identifying where the risks are. And let's start by having a European risk assessment exercise in a very comprehensive way where every single member state will do it in their own way to assess where the risks are, to then be able to push forward the toolbox and to to propose and design and reframe a European response that do make sense. I think you see how, despite the best effort of the Commission to basically propose a concept, propose a way forward, you have had this backlash from member states. At the same time, it's a trajectory. We are going there. And you see bits and pieces of member states going there. You see the G7 that has pushed this question of economic security, economic resilience quite far. Some member states have done the risk assessment, others haven't, but they have started consulting companies. And by putting this issue on the European agenda, it has become a key issue that penetrated the debates throughout the member states, throughout companies. And now you have more and more European companies that are coming, that are having questions about economic security and this articulation, and that are seeing this concept of de-risking as even more important as before. So despite the fact there is no unity at this stage. I think it's a process. I think it's a trajectory and we are a better place. When it comes to thinking about Europe on and the European China policy and whether or not there is unity, I would say between 2016 and now, we have enjoyed a very good degree and almost unprecedented degree of unity. So there has not been any major backlash when it comes to European China policy. We have gone into this very complex way to engage China and this was very new and all the member states are feeling comfortable with this multifaceted approach and this is what we started to do in 2019 which is to rethink our engagement with China and question how much we can actually cooperate with China and the reality is less and less. 
The second pillar is probably how do we collectively defend ourselves, protect our markets, protect our citizens. And here, over the past five years, the UN member states have built up a gigantic toolbox to address level playing field issues, a lack of reciprocity, to start addressing this question of economic security with instruments such as the foreign direct investment mechanism. We have had work on 5G, work on cybersecurity that was done. So this concept of bringing security in the China framework and collectively coming up with instruments this shows how much unity there is. And there is a last pillar, which is the question of coercion. And we have designed a mechanism called the anti-coercion instrument, which has as a goal to prevent any cases of coercion. So to defend ourselves, we have gone very far. And the last element where we have also enjoyed a good degree of unity is to partner with others. And Australia has enjoyed it, Japan as well, the US, of course. So we have come as well to a point of partnering with others on China. That was very new for Europe. And we did it collectively. Yeah, again, a great, a great summary. And uh, as you say, to actually have success in de-risking and defending, you need to partner with trusted and reliable allies. Can we just delve into that a bit? Our listeners will hear a lot about the difference between decoupling and de-risking. You referenced yourself 5G. What's interesting for us in Australia is that there does seem to be a different set of approaches in Europe. Some have made the same decision Australia did, in which Chinese companies like Huawei are not allowed into the telecommunications sector, whereas we have the economic powerhouse in Europe in Germany having not made its 5G decision yet. So can you take us through what you mean when you talk about Europe looking at a de-risking approach and what that means across the EU as a whole? Yes. So de-risking first was a term that the President of the Commission articulated in April 2023 to say, look, there is 90% of our trade with China that is unproblematic. And it's about products and goods where there are no security implications, no dependency implications, and it's going to be okay. But there are 10% of our trade with China that is problematic, that are a critical dependency for Europe, that create security risks, and this, we are going to address it. And she articulated that to the public also to say we are not going to decouple from China simply because China is today Europe's first trading partner. We exchange 2.3 billion per day with China. This is gigantic. And yes, we have structural issues when it comes to our trade relationship with China. But this is basically a factor to take into account. And this is the reason why Europe is not going to decouple. But the risking, we have started doing it before van der Leyen articulated the term back in 2016 when we saw this, what I was referring to, this massive wave of investment and where we started to say, actually, it poses a security challenge to European critical infrastructure. So we are going to put the responsibility to member states to say yes or no. But there is a chance for member states to say we will ensure our national security on the ground of, of the security challenges it represents. Since 2019, we have come very far, as I said. But, and this is where the but is, you need to de-risk with your companies, and it does mean that your companies need to take the responsibility to change their approach in seeing China not only as an economic opportunity, but also as a risk for yourself, because at the end of the day, a business wants to make money. Uh, so to change that approach, that's one key element on which Europe has had difficulties. And I'm sitting in Berlin today and the German companies are a fascinating case in the way they have been de-risking. Second, it's about convincing national governments because, as I said, security is a national competence. So you have a toolbox at the European level, but the final decision is taken by member states. And this is the debate we see on 5G, for instance, where in Germany there has not been any decision 
on 5G. There is a big debate here with public opinion that is pronouncing itself to basically ban Huawei from the critical infrastructure here in Germany. But the decision has not been made because you also have stakeholders here that are saying this is an alternative that is cost effective. So let's do it. So the debate is not yet settled. And you have this question in a number of countries. You also have cases where the commission said, do not accept this investment in your critical infrastructure because it presents such a level of risks that we deem that this is not acceptable for your national security. And this was the case, for instance, of Costco's investment in the Hamburg port, and Germany still went ahead. And you see how There is so much Europe can do. It's a matter of changing the mindset at the national level. And it's a matter of bringing the public opinion and to bring your companies on board with the way you want to de-risk. Thank you. That's a really good explanation of what has happened, as you say, post-2016 as countries at the national level and then through, in particular, the very good work of the EC, the Commission, that is very much advocating the fact that you can no longer separate economics and security. Can I ask, related to that, if there has been a move from 2016, as you say, also through 2019 on economic security as being a single element and a strategy designed around economic security, if that in itself has moved some, but not all, as you say, it's still at a national level. And in places like Germany, we haven't seen some of the moves that we've seen elsewhere. From my perspective, it looks a little bit like a fear of coercion, not just the economic prosperity side or the the cost effectiveness of the Chinese companies. But if that 2016 and 2019 period of economic security was enough to move everyone, has China's support for Russia since the 2022 invasion been even more of a wake-up call so that whether it be the Commission or the EU or NATO in the recognition that there's no longer a separation between economics and security, is it also the case that we can no longer separate Russia and China? It's a very interesting question and I think it shows how different our strategic culture is. And interestingly, I was speaking to some companies here about the next security challenge. And for them, the next security challenge was not coming to the Russia-China alignment. It was coming from Taiwan. And this question of how do we link prosperity with our security challenges, this is not there yet. I think we are barely going towards a transition where we recognize China presenting a security threat to Europe through its alignment with Russia and through its support to Russia's war efforts. And this is where my sense is the wake-up call is not going to come from the China-Russia alignment. While I think it's strategically, it does make sense. I think the wake-up call came from the case of Lithuania being economically coerced by China. This was back in 2021. And this was the moment where this idea that China can weaponize its trade relations with Europe to coerce a country and force that country to take a behavior, this was where it it was clear. I think... China's providing an economic lifeline to Russia and China's support to Russia's war effort on the battlefield through used goods does not have the same impact because Europe does not see it as a way to be coerced. And in that sense, the link between what's happening today between China and Russia and the concept of how does Europe address economic security vis-a-vis China is not yet there. My sense is that is going to come. But first, Europe needs to acknowledge that China is a security threat for um, the European security architecture. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a fascinating debate. And you talk, as you said, different cultures and strategic insights here. I suppose where I have a problem with European thinking in this area, Abby, I keen for your view, is for the Lithuania case, which, of course, for me, a clear case of coercion. It resonates with what I heard during the conferences that we were at, that a lot of people in Europe, a lot of government officials and even companies in Europe expressed a view that we needed to wait for the smoking gun when it came to China, that we couldn't take any 
security decisions without that smoking gun. My problem with that is once you've got a smoking gun, it means the gun's already been shot. And you talk about the wake-up call being the coercion against Lithuania. My issue here, I suppose, is we have to recognize that there is a capability issue here that China has. And as soon as their intent changes, they can, with a split second, use that capability against us. And so with the fact that you seem to be saying that European countries are not viewing China's support for Russia, including the provision of dual-use goods as a direct security threat, I see that as a problem because it basically means we're telling China or Europe is telling China that the only red line is if China provides actual weapons to Russia, that they can provide everything else just below the line of weapons. And the dual use goods are integral to Russia's recovery effort and the ability to boost their weapon stocks. So we're basically giving China the confidence that as long as they don't provide or don't get caught providing direct weapons, we're not going to do anything about it. And it's the same with the Lithuania case that the fact that we know that they use economic coercion as a threat. But the concern I have is Europe is basically saying, well, threats are okay. So threatening Germany that if you make a 5G decision, we will harm your automobile industry. Well, we're going to avoid that by not making a decision and we won't then face the actual economic coercion. But it's still coercion, is it not? I think there is the question of the thresholds and the red lines that are behind your question and is how much can we accept that we have basically created on ourselves threshold and red lines. And in reality, I don't think we are going to accept for much longer the Chinese narrative that China does not provide weapons to Russia, so it's okay to actually provide the 70% of the dual-use component China yeah. Russia needs on the battlefield. But for this to change, it does mean that Europe needs to recognize that either the red lines have not worked, or, which is my view, recognize that the red lines have worked. And this was okay for a year and a half. And now it's time to adjust these red lines and to tell China, okay, now dual use component is no longer something that Europe is going to find acceptable and there will be consequences. And this idea of consequences is key because the moment you put consequences, you also decrease the level of fear. And the question of that you pointed at, which is, how much Europe is driven by fear when it comes to dealing with China, this is the hardcore experience that Europe is making at the moment. And you see it on the debate related to tariffs over electric vehicles, where you have some countries in Europe that feared so much retaliation from China on sectors, by the way, where really there was nothing to fear from. But okay, fear is an emotion that is not driven by actual facts, that you see still how much fear can be a factor of disunity in Europe, how much this can still work on the leadership in Europe. And we are working on it. And this is why this question of first recognizing China as a security threat in the context of the war in Ukraine is important, linking it with consequences and with saying we need to adjust red lines and we equally need to raise the cost for China to actually basically provide a lifeline to our existential threat. And we are not there yet in our action. We need to get there. And for me, we are in a moment where Europe is experiencing on key challenges, meaning on European prosperity, on European security, on the capacity to provide a sustainable and digital future to our citizens, we are experiencing what it means not to fear China. And we are not there yet. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you uh, there. And I also agree that it is vital that we are both clear with China on what is acceptable and unacceptable activity and that there will be consequences for unacceptable activity. It is even worse at times if you're telling China something is unacceptable, but saying to them at the same time or implying that there will be no consequences. I think this issue of having clarity of what's acceptable and unacceptable and that there are going to be 
consequences and enforcement measures is at the heart of all of our national security policy making right now. We're, we're seeing many countries looking to engage with China because, as we've said, the economic benefits and they're the number one trading partner for, for most countries around the world. But there is a risk of heading down that economic path without looking at the long-term security implications. I would describe it as most countries having an engagement first policy with Beijing and a security second. And it's interesting, in the lead up to last December's EU-China summit, you said in a very interesting quote that dialogue for the sake of dialogue is maybe not such a bad outcome in the current circumstances. This, again, might be an area where we disagree. I think it's a real risk where we get into dialogue for the sake of dialogue, but it's, it's far from simple. Can you take us through what you meant by that, both in terms of the dialogue for the sake of dialogue and also your reference to current circumstances, whether you actually see the current circumstances changing? Yes, and uh, I like disagreeing with you, Justin. I think it makes the conversation <laughs> much better. <laughs> when Excellent. I said uh, dialogue for the sake of dialogue is maybe not such a bad outcome in the current circumstances, it's this idea that if you do not speak to China, what's the alternative? That you do not speak to China. And I think this is probably one of the worst situations in which we can be. So compared to... Not speaking, I think dialogue is by default better. And it's better because since, I would say, 2020, since the sanctions over Xinjiang, the economic coercion with Lithuania, the COVID pandemic, Taiwan, sanctions over cyber attacks, the war in Ukraine, we have experienced a complete deterioration of EU-China relations. And this is the trajectory in which we are, and this is going to continue. We are seeing right now on the tariff on electric vehicles, there will be more tariffs coming. So this is regardless the trajectory. And being capable of doing two things. One, explaining to the Chinese, you are for instance, putting together an industrial policy that has as consequence of a capacity which is going to hit Europe, which is going to destroy our competitiveness. So we are going to simply create barriers. This is important because if we do not explain that, China is going to draw its own conclusion and address it in its own way by overreacting or reacting in not the appropriate way. So important to explain. And second, it's also through that process, you also give agency to China, which is what we are seeing on the electric vehicles, but this is also what we saw on the war in Ukraine. And this is the idea that once you have explained to the Chinese leadership, this is the state of play for Europe, these are the consequences you're going to face, you also give the possibility to China to say, okay, so if I do want access to the European market today, I need to do A, B, and C. So I need to address subsidies in my own country. And yes, it may be a very big challenge. Yes, changing China's industrial policy and economic model, this is quite big as a challenge. But at the same time, there is this understanding that China can still do something. And this is why there was consultations between China and Europe for one week. So giving agency Talking about the issues, I think that's important. And this is why I said that today, the circumstances have changed in the sense that, as I said, further deteriorations with tariff. But most importantly, we are going to have the U.S. elections. The U.S. elections are going to affect U.S.-China relations. And by default, it's going to affect Europe-China relations, but equally australia China relations. So the US-China dynamics has such an impact for all of us that it's tremendously important to continue having these channels of communication open with Beijing to also be able to tackle the dynamics that will be ongoing there and that will affect us. There's a lot there. Let's see if we can get through a little bit of that diving into. I suppose my concern, Abby, is that I completely agree. Dialogue is important. Far better to be talking than not talking, but it becomes an actual risk for democratic countries like us if we show that we're putting such a priority on dialogues and calls and meetings that Beijing 
feels and knows that it can use even dialogue as a coercive tool and says that, well, I'm not going to talk to you unless you do something or I'm not going to talk to you unless you are silent on something. So that's the risk of if we put dialogue at such a level of being the outcome that China will use that against us like it does in so many other sectors. But am I right then as part of that, your answer in describing your view on how countries, particularly in Europe, should structure their China policy as maintaining diplomatic engagement while supercharging their national level policies to combat Beijing's malicious activity. As an example, is is that how you would describe the French China policy where on one day we can actually see physically President Macron hugging President Xi, and then the next, leading the development of European industrial policy, as you've described, imposing tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, for example. Last time we saw each other, we had a fantastic conversation about French-China policy. So I'll try to say a few words about this. But first, let me come back to you on this question of dialogue, engagement and cooperation. And I think the three shouldn't be mixed. And when I said dialogue, I meant channels of communication open. You're right, because maintaining engagement is important. And it's what I explained earlier in the podcast. There is this articulation in Europe-China policy where you were right in summarizing it. There is engagement, there is defending ourselves, and there is partnering. And I think we have come to a point where engagement has shrunk, not for all the countries, but for most of them, engagement no longer means extensive cooperation. And this is where I agree with you. But Engagement does not represent, per se, a challenge for our democracy. I think maintaining channels of communication open with your first trading partner is somehow essential. But the defensive aspect has grown so much. This has become the core of how do we address China in the strategic competition, but also how do we address our two models of governance that are simply so far away that are completely irreconcilable. And you're right, because When you ask about the French positioning and their articulation, and I'm just going to give you two examples. One is Orban's visit to China, which is taking place right now. And there is no other Orban in Europe, right? And we are somehow lucky for that. But Orban, before going to China, went to Russia. And with Russia, we have a policy of no engagement, no channels of communication. And having Orban in Russia is heavily problematic for European security, but also for the rest of the European partners. And today we will have a case of big disunity coming at the next European Council over that simple step of going to a country where we have agreed not to have dialogue with. And I think this is a backlash that we can't afford in the case of China. We can't afford it in the case of Russia, but in the case of China, it would be even worse. So having this common framework, including on engagement, is also very important to reconcile the Hungarian view with the Spanish view or the French view. When it comes to the French, I think the beauty of the French approach is this strategic ambiguity and it's this capacity to put... China's support to Russia at the core of Xi Jinping's visits uh, to China and having the Chinese all along the preparation telling the French, why are you doing that? Don't do that. And at the same time, having the capacity to sign business deals more than the German themselves in the margin of the visit. And the way Macron did it, including in saying, I'm going to make this extra effort to Europeanize the visit, was very different from the way the German did it. And I think another leader who did that, this articulation was Mark Rutte, when he went to China, did exactly the same as Macron, which was to put back China-Russia in the core, at the forefront of the agenda, hitting the Chinese on the dual use question and with the question of consequences, while at the same time saying, look, we want to sign deals, let's go for it. So it's engagement on our terms rather than engagement on Beijing's terms and your discussion there around single countries. And as you say, fortunately, we've only got one or ban, but all those authoritarian regimes Russia, China, they want to deal with us separately, which is where bringing it back to the collective, whether it be the EU or 
Europe and, and Indo-Pacific countries is always best for us. Is this what we're seeing, Abby, in terms of industrial policy being back in vogue in Europe? We've recently seen just earlier this year, France, Germany and Italy pledging a coordinated economic policy. Is that type of collective action going to be what's required? And could I ask you about that, that the actions are really important, but the importance of narrative and messaging here with all these issues, that from my perspective, and I think from many perspectives, for people who are out here in places like Australia, Japan, we look at the messaging around some of these coordinated policies, and we see that they're not just messaging to counter Beijing and its malicious activity, but it also seems to be a counter or a protection against Washington. So the challenge there or the risk there is that we actually aid Beijing's narrative of a false or moral equivalence between China and the United States. So where do you draw the line here around the really important collective action that deals with the pressures and challenges and threats posed by China versus what's required in the Europe-US context? I like talking to you because even your questions are very strategic thinking. Look, I think it's a it's a question where first we need to start by what does Europe want? And I think in Europe there is this very strong sense that European competitiveness is disappearing and is being challenged left, right and center, first and foremost by China, but equally not equally, equally wouldn't be the right word, but also by other partners like the US. There is no equidistance in the way Europe assess the challenges on its competitiveness coming from Beijing and coming from the US. And you see it on what we are going to do on foreign subsidies and on subsidies and on this question of Tariffs, I think the electric vehicle ones are the beginning of a series of tariffs that we are going to see emerging, restricting China's access to the European market. And this is meant to actually ensure level playing field and competitiveness for our companies. And this protecting toolbox can only achieve its objective to ensure European competitiveness if it is coupled with a solid industrial policy. And the question of the industrial policy, and I think there you're right, is also aimed at tackling what the US has been doing with IRA, for instance. And Europe is constrained by its own framework, right? We are strong believers of the WTO and any efforts that would go beyond the framework of the WTO would not fly in Europe. We are constrained about 27 different ways to think about industrial policy. In France, we have zero problem to talk industrial policy. In Germany, they do. And this effort of France, Germany and Italy is actually quite restricted if you look at it. And you also see over the past three years, we launched a series of efforts at the EU level to have very targeted industrial policy on the high-tech sector and green technology. This project are called IPCEIS. And the reason why you have never heard of them is because they're really tiny. And this was the effort of having industrial policy on specific topics across member states. So you see how complicated it is because of European own constraints, because of our different industrial policy cultures, you see that it's aimed to respond to Beijing and the US, but in a very differentiated way. And once again, everything may change with the next US elections and depending on how the next president is acting as well. But the question of industrial policy in itself is not going to respond to what Europe wants. And Europe wants its competitiveness back. And it's a mix of tools that we will have to use. Some are going to be easy to use, others more complicated. But at the end of the day, it's a mix of this. And one thing that often is not seen from the outside is also that our single market has weaknesses. And in April, there was this big report that was meant as well to look at where the weaknesses of the single market were to address those, which would already be 
a first set of response and an easy one to ensuring European competitiveness. Your statement, Abby, that Europe wants its competitiveness back, I think should be music to everybody's ears. A healthy, competitive Europe is absolutely in the interests of the United States, it's in the interests of Australia and the regional powers here in the Indo-Pacific. So to hear that you think the EV tariffs are just the beginning is, I think, important. It's important to, to have that as the mindset. You also said that it's about levelling the playing field. I think this has been a real shift in recent years where the free trade community, and I, and I would really put myself in that belief in free trade, the problem is that when a country like China buys the market, steals the market, subsidizes the market, there isn't an ability for the free market to level the playing field without some government involvement. So uh, I think we will see uh, more of that. In terms of though this moral or false equivalence, you refer to, of course, the concerns that some in Europe have around what a President Trump second term might bring. But right now with Biden as president, we still hear phrases, including from President Macron around strategic autonomy. As you mentioned, we've got the anti-coercion instrument, which as I understand it was just as much about, if not more about the potential for US behavior activity as it is from China. So do you think that when Europe or France talks about such a level of independence, there's a risk publicly in both the French public, the rest of Europe, and in countries like Australia, that we're not just talking about freedom from coercion by the likes of Moscow and Beijing, but also a sense that we're looking for independence from Washington? It's a complete continuation of our conversation in Czech Republic. And there you basically ask it's, me it's a good as debate. well. <laughs> I mean, a French and an Australian is by default a good debate. Anyway. <laughs> and I think there you question me a lot on strategic autonomy, which I think is key. Yeah. And the question you also pose, we are going to remain, whatever happens, even in a Trump victory, a partner of the US because the transatlantic partnership goes beyond what the US leadership or the French leadership wants. There are people behind, there are companies behind, there is years of common history behind, there are very important security, economic, but people to people ties. So just to say, this form of vision that maybe we would like to take a distance. I'm not sure this is exactly what it is about. And this comparison with Beijing or Moscow, this is, for Europeans, this is not even a question, you know. But I think there is this understanding through the war in Ukraine, through the COVID pandemic, that Europe needs to become geopolitical. And being geopolitical means that Europe needs to start to look after its own interests and act on the basis of its own interests. And in a way, the question of strategic autonomy is very much related to that. And I think it should be read as the capacity of Europeans to choose their dependencies. And Europe is going to remain dependent to the US and the interdependence is very important. So there is not question about this, but we will need to look after our security for our own sake, not because the US has told us. And this is a crucial point as well in strategic autonomy. Very well said. I like your phrase that the capacity to choose your dependencies, I mean, that's exactly what sovereignty is about. You're right. We started this conversation in Europe. We've continued on the pod. I'm sure we will continue to have it. I could go on for a long time, as you know, as a final question. Clearly, we've re-entered an era of global conflict and instability. We have the wars. We've got the uncertainty, as we've talked about, around where the US might go. Where do you think, as an expert in these areas, where do you see the world in five years? What do you think might be the biggest threat? And can we take any positivity away? Are there any green shoots? Okay, so we are two days after the French elections, and my positivity is simply drawn by the fact that we do not have an extreme right government. This is my degree of positivity, but we will have an ungovernable country. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to the question of positivity these days. And the word in five years, 
I mean, I share your analysis, further fragmentation, further instability, and with that, further complexity for me. And this was the big lesson of France is how much do we bring and how much do we manage to bring our public opinions and our citizens to understand the complexity of the world today. And for instance, we heard in the French campaign, this fast track campaign, things like we want companies to create employment in France again and to leave China. And this capacity, you know, to explain China, to explain the economic model, to explain what's at stake, I think we need to bring the citizens to the degree of complexity that is necessary for them to make a choice and to understand the world. And I see the world in five years at two levels. First, an increasing disconnect between the citizens, the public opinion and their leadership. And with that, the risk of having more extreme right and populist government, even though France and the UK proved us wrong. I think this is a risk and it's an important one. Because if this is happening, we are going to have a reconfiguration of the world order in a way where we are likely to see blocks emerging. And this, I know of all of us as internationalists and a believer of the world as we know it, we do not want to see blocks re-emerging. And this is probably the biggest risk we see. Excellent. I, look, I think you're right. I actually think that the public will continue to prove us wrong. What really is required is, is ongoing political leadership. And I agree 100%. It's not five years from now. We all need governments, leaders to bring societies with us with these threats. The way technology has evolved means that the public are getting their information anyway, just from bad sources and adversaries, if our own governments aren't going to keep us informed. It's been a really great conversation, great debate. Before letting you go, I have a quick question I like to ask guests of the Aspie pod in relation to good book recommendations. And given your unique experience covering Europe, EU, China, the challenge of geopolitics, is there a book that you would recommend that our listeners go out and read, either as a helpful guide as to how we've got into our current predicament or an interesting assessment of where we're likely to end up? Okay, Justin, I'm going to make maybe a book recommendation that is outside your question, or maybe I make two. The first one is... Please go ahead. If you, you want you've to... Got the free, you've got the choice. Capacity to choose, Abby. <laughs> Great. My strategic autonomy back. Two book recommendations. The first one is if you want one day to dive into understanding Germany-China relations, which is a key shaper in Europe-China relations, you need to get yourself the book from Janka Ertel from the European Council on Foreign Relations. And she published this book in September last year. And this is diving you through the complexity of the German debate, which for French living in Germany, this is all new to me, beautiful, fantastic, intellectually challenging. And she dive you through this in an incredible way. But because it's summer and because China is more than EU-China relations, my recommendation and something I like is I always read one book from the deep Chinese literature in the summer. And for this summer, I have Beijing Koma from Ma Jian on top of my list. And it's about the 1989 Tiananmen Square event and someone who goes into coma for 10 years and wake up 10 years after the event and see what happened. And I think for all of us that are China watchers, China analysts, or just people trying to understand China, diving into Chinese literature is a beautiful thing. And it's the thing I do in the summer. Absolutely fabulous. Two really interesting reads for our listeners to uh, go out and enjoy. Abby Vasilia, I really can't thank you enough for uh, the discussion. Thank you for joining us on the Aspie pod and I can't wait to have you back on again. Thanks, Justin. It was fantastic to speak to you. Bye. If you're interested in finding out more about the Sydney Dialogue, we've included a link to the TSD website in your episode notes. And that's all we have time for today, folks. Thanks for listening.